So uh, anyway, this will be break up your fallow ground part two. And uh, probably be several parts of this, but this is, this is coming from Hosea. And uh, I'll just give you the, our, our text scripture here. We'll be looking at some other scriptures. But sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it's time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. And remember we said that was sow to yourselves uh, in view of righteousness. Uh, but break up your fallow ground. And we talked last week that this fallow ground was... Uh, it was the sum of your whole life because your whole life is all of your todays, you know. And we're trying to look at this from the perspective uh, because, you know, remember we talked about last week how we come into the ground, it's not broke up, we put new dirt over top of the old ground and hope things will grow, but it won't. We got to get this thing over into the past, uh, something that we all have. So, so the ground is your whole life, and, and uh, hopefully I can kind of give you a, a, a little bit of a picture today. And remember we talked about the, uh, the, the reckless sower, the, the sower that ain't got a lick of sense that sowed the seed, sowed the word of God, and he just went and he, he I mean, foolish God sows seed on bad ground. I mean, what kind of God is this that sows seed on rocky soil? Any. Smart farmer knows not to do that, wouldn't you? Go out to a rock cliff and sow seed on it, you're just wasting the seed. But the Word of God would return into a void, Clyde, so it's going to serve a purpose. And, uh, Patty was talking about the presence of God. What I'm going to tell you today is uh, you can't help it. You can't prevent it. You can't stop it. So, I, I, you know, I, I love this stuff. And I, we're going to look at, you know, Look at this fallow ground. This this this, this ground. That, you know the rocks and the you know the broken lives, the the pain, the 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 jeans. You know, but I'm not talking about the blue jeans. I'm talking about the jeans. You know, we got uh, Dr. Sayers with us, and you know when you go up there, you got to fill out this paperwork, and this paperwork says, you know, do you have heart disease? Do you have high blood pressure to have on because there is an inherent thing in our natural bodies that come from the fall that's in our genes that's just that we're born with but i'm talking something that's above and beyond that you know that goes back into our past and brings healing up into our future i mean because they know they they look around and they they see well this this is a uh uh a likely to happen thing, you know. I, I don't know what's the word for it, but it's something they can be checking out. Well, he had blood, high blood pressures. Dad had high blood pressures. Granddaddy had high blood pressure. You know, they all died of a stroke. So break up your fallow ground. We're looking at that from conception all the way up until the present moment. And remember, we said we kind of kind of left you hanging there last week. Uh, in all that pain and abuse, why doesn't God stop it? You know? I mean, that's the question for everybody. Why doesn't God step in? You know, and we take this thing in bigger pictures, Clyde. Why doesn't God step into North Korea? Why doesn't God step into the uh, Chinese? Why doesn't God stop Hurricane Irma? You know, why doesn't he do all of those things, right? Why are we here in the suffering state of being that we are hoping for one of these days to get out of this place and you know, I you know I, I, I tell you guys this, but do you realize that to most Christians, heaven is 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 the absence of something? You ask Christians what heaven is. Well, there I won't be sick no more. I'll, it's the absence of something, not the presence of something. You, you see the difference? Why didn't God? Stop it, you know. And I was talking to Morgan this week. She come home from work all mad, and we, you know, we began to talk. And I said, "Did you listen to me last week at the message?" She said, "Yeah." 
I said, so what is this anger? Unmet expectation. I mean, that's summing up anger, right? I had expectations. My expectation wasn't met, so therefore I'm angry. And see, inside of that anger is all this. Uh, uh, one thing that goes with anger is fear. Fear even jumps out in front of anger because I know there's, you know, and then anxiety, stress, all of these things. I, you know, and I, I you know, we, we got another studier right here, you know, hopefully he'll be a, a doctor. Yeah. You know, Josh, one of these days I might be a doctor. <laughs> it could be. It could be. I'll be an honorary doctor. Doctor of stupidity. I, I'm serious, Josh. I, I could get it. I could get it. I'm already way qualified. Yeah. 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 So everybody can go around and say, hey, our pastor's a doctor. He's a doctor of stupidity. Yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, why doesn't God stop it? Why is all this anger? Why is all this anxiety? What I was going to tell you was with these, with these doctors, I, I don't know what the percentage of cases that go to a doctor that are in this category of unmet expectation, in other words, stress, you know, anger, that causes all these other things, you know, hypertension. Yeah, there's hypertension. We treat you for that, but it affects your natural organs, your stomach and liver and kidneys and, and muscles and everything, uh, you know, tight tense, headaches, uh, you know, and learning something about migraine headaches and where they come from and and all that stuff. You know, I didn't know, but I mean, I, we're, you feel these things coming on, and isn't it amazing that you're always in a set of circumstances? Even if I'm not doing anything, but I'm projecting into the future some expectation that, that I realize how am I going to meet it? What am I going to do? If God doesn't step in, I can't meet this. I can't do this. And you feel the stress and anxiety coming on, and you're like, God, why are you let all this stuff happen? Why don't you just step in? And then, oh, God, one of these days I get to go to heaven and I won't have a headache anymore. See, the absence of something. But we got to break up the fallow ground. God put us here for a reason. I mean, He didn't just. You, my God, he created the universe. Took his hand and pulled up some dirt and made him a man and breathed into that man for a purpose, Clyde. He put his man right where he wanted him, in this world, in this earth, in a garden. Can you believe that God created us? Uh, listen. Sometimes I just, I'm amazed. Zach was out last night at 2 o'clock in the morning looking at the stars. I don't know if anybody went outside. It's flat, beautiful. And, you know, we see stuff through the haze. And I just think, you know, God put those stars up there. And he did. Orion, I love to look at the constellation. Cassiopeia. Sagittarius, you know, Jupiter, I love to look and watch these things go through the heaven. I think God created all and put us man here, Clyde. No, and this wasn't no two rocks banging together and an accident, two amoebas forming a man and growing up. God formed this guy and put him and breathed in for a special purpose. So then we get, why, why all this junk that goes on? If he really loves us, right? Have you ever said it? If God really loves us, he wouldn't let this happen. See, that's the problem. We don't realize that we are these incredible creatures. And I'm just going to say this right here. You're the only creature in the universe made in the image of God. I mean, do you realize that? I mean, you ever just stop and think on that. Do you realize the heights that you were created for? Now listen, when I say these things, I'm going to tell you the flat meaning of life today. People search their whole lives wanting for the meaning of life. People take sabbaticals and go on journeys and buy uh, space tickets to the moon to find the meaning of life. And here, a doctor in stupidity is going to give it to you right here in a minute. I'm going to give you the meaning of life, the, 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 the reason for creation. 
I mean, there was, there was a reason when God made all this stuff and did all this stuff. This earth this was a stage. You, you guys ever heard that old song, The World is a Stage and Each of Us Play a Part? Oh, well, the song. But really, that's, that's true. This earth is, is a stage in which the, the purpose, the plan to be worked out. Or we could say the reason you're here. So what is this grand reason? Let me say it this way. The, the reason is that you should be the intimate friend, even more than that, the child, kinfolk of the Holy Trinity himself. I mean, go go read the Bible. And when, they were, when these guys were referring back to God, they would say, remember Abraham, your friend? I mean, you were called to be the child of the living God. Do you ever just think about that? Well, I'm a son of God. And we walk around like a stupid idiot. But I'm talking about the God that parts the Red Sea. The God that said, let there be light. And there's been light ever since. Made you, made something out of dirt. And said, I'm going to make this guy my friend. I'm going to bring this guy into the courts of heaven. And wherever he goes, Clyde, even the animals will know. Even the fishes will know. What do you mean the fishes will know? Because God said, a fish, go get in the net. They go get in the net. Fish, go find me a quarter. And the fish goes and finds him a quarter and says, bring it here to him. I mean, these things really happen. Do you, I mean, do you ever just think about that? You were created. In order, by the grace of God, gifted with life, God gifted you with life in order to gift you with himself. You, re you realize that life ain't a thing. God, Christ is life. He gifted you with himself. I mean, what more could you want? For what purpose? To exalt you to sit in the circle of the <coughs> Holy Trinity. A valid, authentic child of God. Not some stepson. Not some stepchild. But a real, valid. I mean, you, you ever just read the epistle of John? Behold, what manner of love. Behold, I mean, just, you know, when I told you that word behold, it's like you're walking through a, a winter's day and you see a rose bloom down. It's not, this is something odd. This is something extraordinary. How could a rose be here on this snow-covered morning? I mean, it's out of place. Behold, so we stop and we look and we gaze and we, behold, what manner of love is this that we should be called the sons of God. But we don't understand it. We don't understand it. We can't see it. Because we look at our past and we got all this stuff in our past and we, we don't understand all the pain and the hurt and the abuse that's brought us up to today. How can we? But see, that's why we're here. That's the meaning of life. That's the purpose of life. That, now see, that sounds so simple, doesn't it? Sounds so simple, though. The reason you were created was to be God's child. Oh, God, I thought it was going to be something greater. The reason I was here was so thus and thou and thou shalt. And... Oh, it's just simple. You're called to be the son of the living God. I mean, is that not enough? Good God Almighty. Sometimes we, we think that's not enough. I want more. See, this is what happened in the garden, wasn't it? Oh, Adam and Eve. Living in paradise, I see people, uh, this is what gets me. Here's Adam and Eve in heaven itself, in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden. I mean, in that place, he can walk up to a daggone grizzly bear and rub him on the head. Grizzly bear licking him on the face. Lying over here, and he can just walk up. And that lion knew, that lion knew that Adam was the son of the living God. 
I didn't lie. Every time I didn't lie, they look over, just look up and said, hey, you see that one walking upright? He's made the image of God. He's running this whole thing right here. But that wasn't enough for Adam, was it? That wasn't enough. Adam says, I can do this by myself. God, I don't need you. Just get on out here. Man, that's the pretty woman you give me right here. We'll handle this thing. We'll be as gods. See the lie. We'll be as gods. Apart from you. Independent from you, God. We don't need you. But see, it's from this base. From this base, what I mean is that we're called to be the son of the living God. That we go out and do everything that we're doing. And, and, and that being the, the stewards of the universe. But all of this begins in a relationship with God. That's why we're here, to be in this relationship. But in order, now here it goes back to our question. But in, so why does God let this happen? In order for that purpose to be fulfilled, we must exercise a freedom of choice. There must be free will. An authentic freedom. Not a manipulated freedom. If not, we'd be robots. We'd be puppets. You can't have a relationship with a puppet. You know, here's the way that I was raised. Uh, in this thing that we call election. Okay? You know, we, we come up, a lot of us in different backgrounds. Presbyterian, Baptist, Methodist, all, all kinds of stuff. I believe in the sovereignty of God. I absolutely believe in the sovereignty of God. And I'm going to show you something about the sovereignty of God today. But listen, here I, here I was, and here's what I, I always looked at ourselves as being a low-down, uh, dirty, rotten scoundrel of a person. Okay, no matter what, we've all sinned, you know. So the biggest thing a preacher's supposed to do is get up and talk about how bad a person you are. But here's God, this, uh, this great being that lives off on planet heaven somewhere, and he's, he, uh, you know, the only way I could view him was he was a narcissist. And he demanded somebody to worship him, but he knew none of us creatures were worthy to worship him. So he's got this little, he's got this little vial called the Holy Spirit. So he looks down and he says, I'm going to choose Clyde to worship me today. So he pours the Holy Spirit on Clyde. Clyde starts shaking and a pop and he starts worshiping. And then God had said back said, yeah, see, I'm being worshiped. Thus and now the great mighty one. Clyde's worshiping me, you know, in the church service. And then God says, well, I feel good now, so I'm going to take my Holy Spirit back. Clyde's back to being a rotten, low down, dirty scandal. God satisfied because he just got worshipped and we'll see y'all next Sunday. This is the way I grew up, you know. We can't worship him unless spirit in the truth and God's going to pour the spirit out on you and then it's only on a select few. But see, this makes God a narcissist like God has to be worshipped and he's sitting up there saying, my God, won't somebody worship me? I'm the great one. God is love. Yes. God is love. God is light, but God is love. He's not up there saying, you better worship me or I'm going to bust you up and give you kidney stones. But see, that's not it. That's not it at all. God, you worship him when you get in his awesome presence and you find out how magnificent and awesome he is. Then you start to give him praise and honor. Seek his sons, but listen, I, we was going over this a little bit on Wednesday night, but let me tell you something. This has just set on my mind so much. You remember the covenant made with David and Jonathan? A covenant that was made years before when they were teenagers. And then all of a sudden they go up. And Saul's dead. Jonathan's dead. Meshiva Beth and all Jonathan's sons are hid out in all these little towns. And, and then here's this one named Meshiva Beth over in this little town of Lodabar. And David comes up and says, Is there any of the house of Saul, any, any of the house of Jonathan that I can show mercy to. And listen, guys, get this Western thinking out of your mind that mercy is pity. That's the American definition of, of mercy. You know, God, I was, oh, I'm just going to have pity on you, Clyde. I feel so sorry for you. That's the word for, for mercy in the Western United States. You know, God is a merciful God. It means I should have killed you, but I did. God is love. He ain't out to kill anybody. He's love and he's, he's light. And, and uh, in the Hebrew, the Hebrew word for mercy was his loving kindness. And he says, my God, is there anybody I can share this greatness with? He's looking around saying, man, is there somebody I can be good to? Holy Spirit, go find me somebody I can be good to. Somebody who will receive my goodness. So he seeks such that he can pour his goodness in. But see, we in our darkness uh, mind said that we believed the lie. We said, no, God. 
What does the psalmist say? A fool says no in his heart to God. No, God, I don't want your goodness. I don't want your loving kindness. I can do it on my own. See, I love it when somebody finally comes to the breaking point. Finally, when they begin to cry out and say, I can't. I can just see heaven leaping up and down and saying, finally. I love it when the people are standing there looking at the rivers of Jordan and they're swelled up at this time and they look across and say, I can't. God said, finally. Finally. Now. Now, to stick out your hand, stand still and see the salvation of God. Hmm. But see, guys, we're called to make this choice. Called to choose. You know, we say, well, no, many are called, few are chosen. Well, listen. You know, I used to have a home phone. I don't anymore. I just got a cell phone. But still, yet, you call me. I have the option, Kathy, of answering that phone or not, don't I? Can, and now it's even worse because I can look and see Jeff Mathis. Say, I ain't talking to Jeff. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. I have the option. Many are called. That means all are called. This calling goes out and said, you know, just like we were singing, come to the river, come to the table, come, you know, come to the water, eat, come, come. The calling goes out. Now, you know, that is not what he says to as many as received him. To as many who answered that call. And you know, this wasn't a one-time thing. My God, this, this goes on and on and on. God has lavished his love upon us. Laid out before this, this incredible plan. But for this relationship, there must be a response to this love. Love must be accepted. It must be received. It must be walked in. And all this done in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the love of God. The love of God is not some ab abstract thing. The love of God is personified in a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. And where is he? Christ in you. The hope of glory. My God, you walk around in a cloud of love. Don't even know it. And in this love from creator to creature. And in that responding to that love is trust, obedient trust. Because, see, we haven't known God. I'm telling you what, guys, just now, 50 years old, I'm beginning to understand God because I realize walking this floor right here, back and forth one night, back and forth, wondering what is going on, and God squeezed it out of me. I'm afraid of you, God. My whole life. I didn't trust him. Been through hell too many times. And every time, there was always somebody there to remind me of my sin. Well, the reason, Big Jim, that you're in this situation is because of this. And you know what? Most of the times, they was right because I have done. I am a true doctor of stupidity. Really, I mean, the hurt and pain I've caused upon myself is just being stupid. Where is God? Why didn't he stop and clap? So my only view of God was he's sitting up there. And, and always I used to think he's right on the verge saying, you know what, Jim? One more time. My mercy endureth forever except for you. Did you ever think that? That his mercy, because I can look at people and say, man, I know old John over here. He has messed up over and over and over and over and over. So we begin to compare. So then here I am. And, I'm, and you know, oh God, this was a scripture I used to use on. When I say use on, it's not to use to build me up and to give me confidence, but this was a scripture. They'd say, oh, you know, Jimmy, where much is given. Uh, God, much is required. So there I would, I would fall back in my vast knowledge and say, oh my God, he, God has lavished me with love and I've blown it again. I don't know if you ever felt this way, but then I'm just like, well, God, you know, I want you close. Yeah, God, I want you in the boat with me. If you're sleeping, that's okay. When the boat starts sinking, I'll wake you up. You just stay right where you're at and we'll get I'm beginning to realize, you know, I don't want to brush my teeth without him. 
You know, I'm coming to that point. I'm coming to right. I'm coming to see that God is truly love. And there's and see when you find that out, there's a trust there. There's an obedient trust there. Let me let me keep going here. We join God. We're joined. We're joined to the Lord. He that's joined to the Lord is what? One spirit. And that can't be forced. It can't be manipulated or falls apart. So, so you know, looking at this picture, man chose. We, we chose, and what was the choice that we made? Scripture says we've all turned, we've all sinned, come short of the glory of God. You know, you know all that. We, we've all turned to our own way. So, so what is this glory? And I won't be able, well, I've got to go read this scripture just a little bit. You can't go to church without reading the Bible. <laughs> I got it. Y'all left. And you say, well, what, was it? what did the preacher, what was his text today? Well, he don't read the Bible. Why? Because he's a doctor of stupidity. He don't read the Bible. But, I, so I guess I'll do this. You know, we got a couple visitors right here. I don't want to go out in my name and be trashed all of it. You know that guy I pray wears blue jeans and don't even read the Bible. So this is really a Bible. Let me just, uh, John 17. I was looking at these verses last night. Gosh, I wrote it in red. Huh. Somebody asked me one time, what's all the red letters in the Bible for? I said, I guess the black run out of ink when they was printing them pages. Because, <laughs> you know, when that happens, Cloud, when I'm running off copies and my black ink runs out and everything comes up red or something, you know, some other color. I said, I guess when they was printing the Bible. But I don't know. John 17, listen to this. And... And, and verse 21, that they all may be one. They, that, that they is you and me. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I've given. What? The glory which God gave to the Son, I've given them. That they may be one, even as we are one. Now, see, we got to look at this glory here because, guys, I've wondered about this glory. But he says, the glory that I've got, I've given to them. What? That they may be one. Because I thought glory meant that, that, that you went around glowing, right? Halos and all that other stuff. Because it doesn't, how can you have glory when you need a haircut? Right? I thought glory meant you shimmered and shaked and all that other stuff. But, but these people are walking around in glory that they may be one. And then he goes on to say this. I and them, thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one. So we get to this one. We get to this union. That the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved me and thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also. Wait a minute. That, this is us again. Whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. Where is he? He's in glory with the Father. And Jesus is praying because really the red letters, y'all know this is Jesus talking here. But the red letters, he's praying that I want them to be where I am. We couldn't be one any other way, could we? This, this is not a this is not a, a, a two house to stay here. This is not the husband living in one house and the bride living in another house. This ain't even the husband living in one room and the bride living in another room. This is a one room house and they live together and we're that house and we're filled with, with him. You, you see what I'm talking about? That they may be one. They be, that they may behold my glory. What, what is that glory that they're beholding of him? His relationship with the Father. That's what he's talking about here. That he's one with the Father. That they may behold that I'm one with the Father. And if they will see that they're one with the Father, see, that's why John could write, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But when we see him, we'll be like him. We'll see him as he is. And how is he? One with the Father. You see what I'm talking about? So glory is... Glory is bringing us to this knowledge of this great relationship you've been called to. How can it be any more simple than that? But we use these words that are shrouded in mystery. Glory is a relationship with the Father that goes all the way back. You see, this ain't just any relationship. I can have a relationship with a dog. That relationship with a rose bush. This is a relationship with the Creator. A glorious relationship. O oh, righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known these, and these have known that thou hast sent me. 
and I have declared unto them thy name. What is the name of God? And I will declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and what I am. What is God's name? I hear all these, well, God's name is Jehovah. God's name is Jehovah Jireh. God's name is Lord. God, God's name is Father. What is that saying? So the spirit in you cries, what? Abba, Daddy, Papa, Father. <clears throat> all right. Oakland, I didn't make 1145. That's okay. All right. I got 13 pages of notes on page two. <laughs> That's not okay. <laughs> I'm going to hurry. See what we want. We, we talked about this on Wednesday night, me and Tim. We were talking about, you know, like ball games and stuff. We're up there praying, and I'm praying for this team to win. What do you think the parents of them other players are doing? They're praying for them to win. And we're like, ooh, we get the most praying. They're going to step into the ball game. Well, we'll see, bring that over into life because, you know, we got these enemies and backstabbers. So we're up here praying and we're thinking, oh, God, you have to destroy our enemies. And see, and, you know, we're manipulated by the news media. And we think, well, God, you know, the North Koreans, you got to protect us. We're the holiest nation. We're in God we trust. And we got to run on our money. And these North Koreans are, you realize the North Koreans are made in the image of the very image of God, too? You can't say that from the pulpit, but that's the very truth. And the Chinese and the Australians and the Americans and the American Indians and the Eskimo, all made in the image of the living God. And God wants to lavish them with his love as much as he does us. That's hard to believe. That's hard to fathom, isn't it? So while I'm trying to pray for God to wipe my enemies out, who is the enemy of the North Koreans? They're praying to their God to wipe their enemies out too. So we both got to, we want God to mash the button to wipe the enemies out when he does it. All of us is gone. Right? Just like we're talking about in these crazy ball games, huh? You know? So how does God manipulate all these things and work? We're not robots. And see, this thing gets complicated to our brain. How can God let us have free will and wreck the havoc in this world and cosmos and earth that we do and at the same time be achieving his plan that they may be one, that we may be where he is, that they may know my glory that thou hast sent me? How can he bring us into this relationship? Well, there's a story in the Bible that covers this. Isn't that amazing? Every time there's a story in here. God's pretty smart. This is the story of this guy named Joseph. Y'all remember Joseph? Youngest son, favorite. He had the coat of many colors. You know what that meant? You know, the in the Hebrews, let me just give you this little, little bit of a of, of piece. Of Reuben was the oldest. So that means, you know, according to the law and all this stuff, Reuben would have got the double portion birthright. And, 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 of course, that, that in the story is realized as the coat of many colors. So, and, and, you know, Joseph got it. Joseph is next to last been born. I think Benjamin was the baby baby. Joseph was uh, uh, the firstborn to Rachel, uh, you know, jo uh, uh, Jacob's real love. And he took the coat that was supposed to give to Reuben. Isn't that amazing? Firstborn. Who was the firstborn? Adam, you and me, first. Esau, Harry, red all over us. But the elder shall serve the younger, right? So instead of Reuben getting the coat, Joseph got the coat. So here's Joseph. He's a young boy. Now listen, guys, I'm just going to throw this out there. These other 11 brothers, don't think of them as walking around reading the Bible every day. This happened thousands of years ago, Clyde. These guys are rough, probably carried knives. You know, killing goats and sheep, wrestling bears, probably punching each other around the campfire, spitting. All the you see when we read the Bible, we don't really see all that stuff. These old big scrawly, but that's the way these lived. They were outdoorsmen. These were these were Duck Dynasty, you know. That's what they were. They were Duck Dynasty. 
They were smelly, Clyde, you know? They were. But here's a little old fancy Joseph walking around in his coat of many colors. Right? He's a little preppy kid. So you know what happened. These guys, they, they got him up and they, they sold him. Found these traitors going down into Egypt and they sold him to him. He comes to Egypt in chains. He's stripped naked and sold on a slave block. This is Joseph, guys. This is what they would do. They would strip him naked, stand him up on a slave block, and people would come by. They would walk around and check him out and see, is this guy going to be good enough to, to, for the work I've got? He was just an animal. This is Joseph with, with a coat of many colors. This is how he comes into Egypt. He's bought by an Egyptian potiphar. You know, he's set up, betrayed by the man's wife. He refused to be seduced, so then what happened? He's thrown in jail for life. Then he's brought out of that, you know, and he's brought to be the, the prime minister, second in command of all Egypt. Egypt ruled the world at that time. Then, then a famine comes, and his brothers, they come down. They don't recognize him. Then he reveals himself to them. Brings the whole family to Egypt. Y'all know the story, but I want to go back and look at this here just real quick. In, in Genesis 50, he's brought the whole family down. Now listen to this verse. Jacob's died. All the brothers are there. Now see, there's a, there's a, there's a fear here. Now look. Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren, and all they went up with him to bury his father. After he had buried his father. All right, we just went to the funeral. Me and my 11 brothers. Me and my 11 brothers. Those 11 dudes who didn't like me. The 11 dudes that sold me into slavery. The 11 dudes that went and put blood all over that pretty coat that I have. Took it back to Jacob, the guy we just buried, and told him I was dead. Eaten by bear. Eaten by wild animals. Now this guy is second in command, oh Joseph. So what do you think the brothers are doing? Look. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, holy moly, Batman. That's what it says in my King James Bible. Holy moly, Batman. Holy moly, Batman. Joseph will hate us. And and what if he what if he has a grudge? I'm just giving you my Jim Moore interpretation. Certainly he will requite us all the evil which we did to him. In other words, what if this guy holds a grudge against us? We are up the creek. So the only thing that kept him off of us here a few minutes ago was Jacob. Now Jacob's dead, and here they're all coming back. And can you imagine the eleven brothers doing a little whip? And this is Christianity today, guys. They're all over there thinking, my God. Verse 16 says, you got to forgive us. In other words, they said, Joseph, I, you remember that time when you went out to get a drink of water and you went in the room? Where's all 11 here? Well, I got 11 witnesses. And Jacob said, oh, Joseph, you got to forgive him. That's what they're saying right there, Joseph. <laughs> so, uh, Joseph, I know that, uh, you know, we're sorry, we're sorry, but your dad said you have got to forgive us because Lord knows if you don't, you're second in command and we're all up the creek. So, you know, they're making this stuff up. You know, Jacob said, you got to forget. Does anybody ever do that? They're still lying, ain't they? Still lying, a bunch of heathen, knucklehead, duck dynasty people. I just want you to see their mindset here, okay? I want you to understand. Get out of the holier-than-thou stuff that goes on. And look at verse 20. Let's just skip on down. Let me, let me just go read 19. Joseph said to them, fear not. Fear not. He's talking to these 11 lying scoundrels right here. Fear not. For am I, am I in the place of God? In other words, only God can forgive. But look at this next verse. But as for you. Let's just look at that right there. But as for you. As for you. Now here's these 11 scoundrels. As for you. 
You captured me when I was a teenage boy. You put your filthy hands on me. You put me in chains. You sold me into slavery. As for you, you meant it for evil. Now that word thought right there, that's the same word as meant. You meant it for evil. You filthy rotten scoundrels, you meant it for evil. You guys laid your filthy hands on me. The beloved, the, the double portion inheritor of your father and my father's family. You laid your stinking filthy hands on me. He confronts his abusers. He doesn't say, oh, it's all right. Oh, yeah, it's fine. He says, no, you meant it for evil. He's not saying, well, it didn't happen and let's just let bygones be bygones. Because I want you to see something here. He said, you meant it. Look at this word. He said, you meant evil against me. You specifically meant it all again against me. It wasn't something you just did and you were throwing rocks and I was walking by and got hit in the head by one of them. No, you aimed at me. You see? You. But God. But God. Meant it for good. In order, in order to bring about this present result, to bring much people to life. Here, I mean, the brothers meant it for evil. Let, let me talk about this for them. The word meant right here, the word meant. It means to, to weave together. It wasn't just an impulse. They planned it. They meant it. They had a plot. They thought it out. They weighed and calculated so it involves the imagination that thinking the thing through, you intended this for evil. It means to create, to, to give birth to an idea that you didn't have before. It means to brainstorm, to have a strategy. You meant it. To bring about a strategy, you meant it. Yeah, yeah, have you ever heard kids and they break something while they say, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to, it was an accident. This was no accident. They meant it. I want, you to, I want you to get that. Because remember, don't forget our tax. Break up your fallow ground. Because we got to look over here in the past, right? So stay with me. You said, he said, you guys sat around the campfire and you hatched the most diabolical, abusive plot against me. You, you, you hurt me because you meant to hurt me. It wasn't an accident when you throwed me in the pit, when you saw the slave traders come by. You meant it. Well, what, did, what, what, what would God do? See, now we're back to those questions, right? Now we're back to those unmet expectations. God didn't step in and stop me from being sold into slavery, did he? God didn't step in and blow his 11 brothers up. But see, that's what we think, right? That's what, that's what the church world is praying for, God to come in and stop the evil. They're lying, they're plots. God, if you really love Joseph, you won't let this happen. Right? So we can't, uh, we can't understand. If you really love him, how could you let this happen? Obviously, I mean, this is the whole book of, of Job, isn't it? My God, Job, surely you've ticked God off somewhere along the lines if you won't fess up. Surely, I mean, how in the world could you have cancer if God loves you? There's no way. Stop. Surely you got to have some hidden sin in there. Surely you got to have something that you're not confessing. Right? That's what we think. So we want to keep God off in a distance. Some would say God is passive. Yeah, he heard them talking, but he allowed it. You ever heard that? Yeah, God allowed it. You ever heard that in church? God allowed it. Some see God as indifferent. Ah, oh, live and let live. Brothers made a plan. God sets by and lets it, lets it happen. We see in all of this, God didn't stop. He didn't stop it, but he's active. He takes the initiative within. The brothers are sitting around the campfire. Listen to me. 
hatching their evil plan, brainstorming, coming up with this evil idea. But they didn't realize God was at the campfire too. Did you ever think about that? God was sitting there at the same campfire with the Duck Dynasty brothers while they're hatching this plan. As they formed their plan in the reality of their free will, God was there and he took their plan that they meant for evil, same word, meant. God took their thoughts that they wove together, only now he brings his thoughts and his ideas into their thoughts. He puts his plot inside of their plot, or should we say he put their plot in his? Because he meant it for good. You meant it for evil, but you overlooked the reality that God was setting in your campfire meeting. The very same plan you hatched, God meant it for good. Same plan. Can you imagine that? Same plan. Same thing that the world meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Now get your brain around that. You can't. You can't. They meant it for evil, but God in His limitless love and wisdom, and they took the very plan and without violating their freedom, He took the plan into His freedom to make their plan a means of good. He took their plan and brought it into His purpose, swallowed their plan up into His mind, and out comes incredible good. This is our God. So even when we sin, even when we're so foolish and stupid, He not only forgives us, but He redeems the very thing. And see, here in this plan, I want you to understand, guys, everybody was involved, wasn't it? The brothers were involved. The father back of the house was involved. The slave traders were involved. Potiphar was involved. Potiphar's wife was involved. The jailer was involved. The prisoners were involved. Pharaoh himself was involved. And all of Egypt, which was the world, was involved. They're all working their individual mint. But it's all swallowed up into his mint. Woven into his purpose. So much that he himself, that God owns the plan. Puts his name on it. God took the energy, the driving force of evil, the, the intent of murder, and swallowed it into his love intention. Didn't mess with the free will. But he does mess with our desires. He does mess with our dreams, don't he? You ever had a vision in a dream? He does tease us, woos us. Go read Hosea. He'll woo you, Clyde. He will. He'll woo you bring you right in and you'll be captured right by love and you won't even realize where you're at until you done had. Even in the Psalms, you go read the Psalms, it says in, in Psalms 105 that God sent Joseph. Wait a minute. These guys hatched the plan to get Joseph into, into Egypt. But God says, you didn't hatch that plan. <laughs> I, he says it in Psalm 105 and verse 17 and he sent Joseph into Egypt. He took it he owned it, signed his name to it. That the 11 evil brothers didn't send Joseph into Egypt. I did that. I mean, did you ever think of that? Joseph, he has this man in Egypt to prepare the way for the people who would follow to save the world from starvation. So the evil in this story here is almost pathetic. All it is is it's just a picture frame picture frame that's, that's around love. So how does he do this? Not by manipulating free will. It's not a chess game. We move. God moves. No. He joins us. He comes where you are. He comes inside our situation and brings us where he is in this moment. We read that, that they may be where I am. Don't forget that. I'm coming in here so that I'm going to bring you where I am. And he started when? He started when you was in your mother's womb to bring you where he is. So all your past and everything, if we'll look back and break up our fallow ground, we'll see that God has been working in our lives way before we ever even realized there was a God. You, you see what I mean? Because his sole purpose, Clyde, is to bring you where he is. 
See, it's a relationship. It's something that God is not directing from planet heaven headquarters over yonder. He sets at the same campfire with you. When you hatched the plan, when the world hatched the plan against it, they meant it for evil. God meant it for good. I used to wonder when I was down there in Dagon, Charlotte and all the crap that was going on in my life and things just uh, kept happening. I mean, I come home from work one day in my house. You can ask the kids and there was a stinking for sale sign in my house. I'm living in it because these people had took my house and put it on Craigslist, trying to sell it right out from under me. I had to spend all this money on these attorneys. I mean, this thing was bad. These people were calling me up. I mean, it was a whole big thing. This state attorney general in North Carolina was out after these people. He got ugly. I'd get called to work and worry about my kids. I'd think, God, what are you doing to me. I'm here. I'm trying to work. I'm going to church at this First Baptist Church. I'm out there every Sunday night and Sunday morning and Wednesday night. Every time the doors open and we're out there on Tuesday night. I'm, I'm trying to do your will, God. What do you want? What do you want? I didn't have any idea you wanted me here because if things would have been smooth, I would have still been sitting down there. But, it, but see, they meant it for evil. I can look back at it. I can walk up to them guys and I can say, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. See, you meant it for evil. Every phone call, every sign you put up, you meant it for evil. But you didn't realize God meant it for good. God meant it for good. Wow. See, yes, there was trauma. Yes, there was blows, less there was loss, there was, there was hurt, betrayal, and lies, and loneliness, and darkness. Joseph hurt, we hurt, but in all the Lord was with him. Taking the blows, taking the pain, betrayal, making it part of his plan, never leaving him, never forsaking him. Jeff, I got about two minutes, brother. Let me just tell y'all this story. Up in the Northeast, there's these artists that live up there. And they go out to, they go out and pick up junk. They go out and they just pick up, sometimes they go to the beach and they, they get junk that's on the beach. And, you know, that's been washed up two or three years by the waves and, and it's beaten and broken in pieces. And they go to the, to the trash pile and, and they, get, they get this junk, broken stuff. Sometimes they even get it from the garbage dump. Stuff that we call trash. And you know what? It was trash. It is trash. And they break it in. And these are... And now, this is true. This is true. And their story is, or, or their, their goal is, their challenge is to take the trash to make something beautiful out of it. Now, just listen. Just stay with me a minute. Me and you look at it and we say, That's junk. That's trash. What are you going to do with that? I mean, it's trash now. It used to be somebody's dreams. It used to be somebody's hopes. Right? Now it's just trash. It's broken. And you know, I love to be around four or five-year-old kids. Because they walk around, man, and you ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? Man, their eyes light up. I want to be a firefighter. I want to play football. I want to be a doctor. You know? work on a railroad and they got these hopes and they got these dreams. And you know, by the time they're 10, those hopes and dreams are dashed to pieces by abuse and by parents' divorce and by everything else and their whole life is a jump. And they graduate or maybe they don't graduate at 18 or 19 years old. They try to get them a job and they try to just get through life and they start using drugs and they start stealing and they start doing everything. It's a pile of junk. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, I used to coach some of these football guys and I would, you know, we down here dealing with the little slurps and the four and the five and the six year olds and they love life. And by the time we get to the 10, 11, 12 year olds, completely different, Clyde. Over here, every mom and daddy's coming and uncle and aunt and grandparents and mom and dad's coming to the game. By the time they get to 11 and 12, they ain't got a mommy. They ain't got a daddy. Grandma's raising them up. You know what I'm talking about. They come to the game. even brings them to the game. Had a couple kids I didn't even realize was living in their car, living in their Ford Bronco with their dad. It was just a dad and this boy and they're living in their Bronco. What kind of hopes and dreams they have? Trash, junk. But here this art 
artist gets a hold of that. It is artistic ability. And he accepts his trash. And he accepts his trash with delight. He was excited, the artist was, to get the trash. I mean, this was the artist's challenge to stay with me. He's going to take this pile of trash and make something beautiful. The more impossible, the more he delighted in it. This is our God I'm talking about. The more impossible, the more he delighted in it. That's why Paul could jump around and say, man, I was chief of sinners. Look at me. I was a murderer. David could jump around and say, God's mercy endures forever. He had a man put to death, committed adultery, brought illegitimate children into the world, watched his own child murder uh, his other child, watched one rape his daughter. I mean, can you imagine the stuff that went on in David's? But yet he could jump up and dance before the Lord and cry out to God's mercy, not pity, but say, this is a loving God who can take this mess and make something beautiful out of it. Something so much that 1,500 years later, when Jesus walked the streets, people would holler up, Jesus, thou son of David. God, what a beautiful thing this is. See, in this, it's the artist. He can show off his ability, his glory. It's now his pile of trash, his challenge. He, he owns it. He picked up the pieces. He caressed each piece. Can you imagine him picking up a piece of your life that's broken, Kathy, that's broken back over here, here, and here, and there, and, and he picks up every little piece because he comes to your campfire, comes to your fallow ground that's breaking it up, and he says, oh, I remember what happened to you in 79, and he picks up that piece of trash that happened to you in 79, and he caresses that piece, and he loves that piece. and 68 and 84 when you was broken and down and hurt and he picks that piece up and says man this might be my favorite piece Josh. this is the piece that was washed up on the shore beaten by the waves people just walked over people kicked it around like it was a can on the sidewalk and he picked that piece up and he caressed it and says man this might be my favorite piece but what am I going to do with that? I'll put it with this piece I, I got over here from 74. Remember in 1974 when you got abused? Oh, yeah. I can, you see what I'm talking about? He can take these pieces. See, each piece was precious to him. He loved it. And each piece passed through the artist's mind. So, so what was a piece of trash now becomes dead to being a piece of trash and becomes resurrected to something that's beautiful. Yes. You see? Break up your fallow ground. See, and I look at it, and I knew it was trash. I seen it in its broken, raw state. But now it's beautiful. Now it's a priceless piece of art. And not only does do what's his last thing the artist does on his artwork. He signs it. He signs it, Pat, and says, that's mine. <laughs> that's mine. Puts his name on there, Picasso. He puts his name on there, Father. What a piece of artwork. God is the artist, you know that. He takes the pile of trash that's our life. When we didn't stand a chance, and he brings it all together. And the love in the face of Jesus Christ, he caressed it all. Let me just finish up right here. I'm just going to go read you this scripture here. I was looking at this. Because, you know, this pile of trash, this is us. We, we want to blame God and we say, you know, God, this is all your fault. We're, we're trying to do all these other things. But listen to this. Ephesians 2 and 10. For we are his workmanship. Do you know what that word workmanship is in the Greek? Poema. Where we get our word poem. 
What is poem? It's a work of art. You are God's work. Written in red, 
that they may be where I am. And he says, I don't care what kind of plans they had, what kind of evil, what kind of disease, what kind of anything is going on. I'm determined to get you where I am. So don't faint in this tribulation. Don't worry about it. And see, in this, we can have trust and we can have confidence and we can set back. And that's what Paul says. And give glory unto the, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It may seem like a small thing to you guys, but it's a wonderful thing to me. I'm going to get out of the way, hopefully. I'm only one hour late. It's not 1145, it's 1245. But I'll make it up next week, I promise. I'm so glad that you guys got to come out. So I'll turn this thing over to Patty. Uh, come and be with us again, okay? Here you go.